Bubba Carter put it best, and I can't quote it exactly like him, but he basically was telling me to come to him, and I was catching, you know, I was catching a bunch, but I was catching singles and doubles. He was like, hey, you're catching doubles, I'm catching quads, move. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin story? Too much alcohol. Really? <laughs> okay. Because if God wanted us to have five glass boats, he would have given us five glass trees. It's... It's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's... I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit, as yeah. far as if I can remember uh -huh. correctly. <laughs> Welcome back, State of Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm Nick Carullo. Um, join with me tonight, Jay Weaver, uh, captain of the Blue Sky, uh, Spencer uh, out of Charleston. Is that right? Uh, Georgetown, South Carolina, Georgetown. but very close. Short, very close. All right. Close enough. Yeah. yeah well, thanks for joining enough. us, Cap. You know, tell us a little bit, you know, where you're from and how you kind of got started. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I was from South Carolina, born in a little town called Bennettsville, a couple hours from the coast and always came down to the coast. And we moved here right after third grade and kind of grew up right here on the water and always into boats, had a little John boat of my own in my backyard by the time I was around 12 and just really took to it and knew us. I always sort of knew it was what I wanted to do. I, I never really knew that you could make a living at it. I just didn't. There's not a lot of people. We're about an hour north of uh, Charleston. and um, But anyway, not a lot of people that I knew growing up that did it for a living, certainly not as adult. And uh, it's just something that, I don't know, I kind of just kept on moving towards it. Had some really good friends of mine, a great family. They had a 31 Bertram, started taking us when we were young, moved that up to a 44 Andy Mortensen called the Pauly Girl. And we started um, and started fishing with them as much as I could. Started getting paid for them when I was about 19. Mm. My parents <laughs> made me made me do the college thing for a few years, so I didn't get to uh, I didn't get to do full start full time till I was almost 24, and um, that was like 2000 2001. I started on a boat here in Georgetown called the Rascal, and then moved to a an ocean yacht in um, Charleston, a charter boat. That we ran a bunch of trips out of and it turned out to just be a wonderful job for me and kind of moved up from there did that till about 06 and just kind of wanted to start traveling and then did did about 10 years of traveling and for the last six or seven years i've been on this boat back here but based out of home which is nice that's awesome hey, a little question about college you know you brought that up because my parents made me go to college yeah. even when i all i wanted to do was fish uh what do you what do you look back on it now are you happy that you were able to get some school in or do you think still that you know maybe you didn't have to do that no no i'm i'm definitely you know happy i did it i'm i'm you know super disappointed with myself for not finishing i left out of my after my senior year just short of graduating from clemson and just you know told my dad this is what I want to do for a yeah. living and you know at the time I mean my first full-time job I think was like $250 a week and you got a little bit from tips and maybe if we would have won some tournaments you'd get a little bit but it really wasn't it wasn't enough to support yourself and then when I first started charter fishing we would go a pretty good bit through the summer and you know you bought a fall you, you'd have a pocket full of money but it had to get you through the winter yeah, and yeah. we would bluefin commercial bluefin fish in the winters and uh you know if you if you had a bad bluefin season and some of those seasons were only five days long before the quota was met so if you had a bad bluefin season you were you were starving come uh come march you know when you started running trips again so first few years you know i was questioning it and that's not true i really never questioned it my parents were very much questioning yeah, you know yeah. the the whether or not I could make a living doing it. And then, you know, you kind of, the industry's just changed so much. There's so many more people doing it now. There's just so much more money in it now. And it just, uh, it's, it's you know, some way you can make a, a, a good living doing. But anyway, no, I wish I would have finished. I don't regret going. I met some great, great people and obviously learned a lot of great stuff while I was there. But I mean, it put me behind in my fishing career, yeah. I would think for sure. And when were you, when you're a charter fishing, like in that time, is that out of uh, South Carolina? That was Charleston. Yeah, I lived Charleston. in Charleston for about six years working on that boat. I made it for them. Um, I think like three seasons and um, and the captain, he had been with them for a long, long time and was just kind of ready to move on. I think he went to like a tugboat or something and the owner gave me a chance to start running it. 
and uh, I thought that was really cool. And he was a real knowledgeable owner. He was a harbor pilot there. He'd had boats since like the 80s. His dad had boats. So he he knew and he helped me with a lot of things that, that I wouldn't have known, you know, without having somebody to teach me as far as moving the boat around at night and safely and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, we fished right out of the Patriots Point Marina and then we fished out of Shim Creek for a few years. I mean, so I know, I mean, obviously now, I, I mean, I think most of people are aware that Charleston has a pretty good fishery, or at least South Carolina has a good fishery. But I feel like, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, people didn't really think that Charleston had a fishery at all. Uh, besides, you know, maybe some of the guys that, you know, were from there, obviously. Uh, I mean, so you're from it, you know, how it, it's good, right? I mean, it's a great fishery. And now I think it's becoming more popular, I think, at least more known about. Yeah, it's a great fishery. I mean, for the last two two years, maybe three years, we've had this random pretty good push of blue marlin in like April and, and into May, June even. And I mean, that's some like really good fishing for, for about anywhere. Um, I think we've had four or five bites in a day, you know, a day or two in a row or something like that. Um, I can't it's be good that. fishing. And then come June, it's you start to get the sales and the whites showing up, which which we didn't really have a good push of sales here this year and until well, I'll say that you know you catch a handful a few days, but um, they they we've gotten a good push of them lately over the last couple of weeks. I think somebody caught nine for twelve nice. this week sometime of sale fish right out of Charleston. So the the fishery's gotten good, but then you know also the caliber of fishing fishermen has, has gotten real good you know all throughout the whole industry but it's hard for me to believe when we were charter fishing all the time you know we might catch 45 billfish in a year and we would be sort of towards top john thomas and them on the sea fix um they, they they you know he probably was more than that he might have been 50 or 60 read boss he might have been somewhere in that 50 or 60 range but i mean I, I feel like if we were out there as much now as we were then i, I would have to think that be the numbers will be way way higher so i think we're getting more fish than we used to is the best thing i can say about that so, and then was there are there more tournaments now or were, were there were still tournaments back then like when you were kind of first yeah you know, there was always fishing? tournaments i i didn't get into the tournaments um that chart the charter boat i worked on we uh i think we do one a year two two a year maybe and we would sort of concentrate on the meat fish because it's just kind of what i knew then i, I hadn't really traveled that much i'd done oregon inlet for like a couple of falls you know right when when the right when you're switching from the J well my first couple of years were J-O and then but right when you're putting dredges in and all that sort of stuff I learned how to learn how to rig a dredge for the first time up there in like 01 um and but anyway I, I wasn't proficient our, our guys that were my that that had come up with me and it had done some traveling by then you already had a group of boats from Charleston going to Venezuela going yeah. to St. Thomas and then they'd come back into Charleston in the spring and I, I didn't really feel like I could compete with them day in and day out bill fishing wise um but it's always you know the governor's cup series has been going on since you know well before my time and it's always been somewhere between three and five tournaments and then that's really about it there used to be some sailfish tournaments in the fall that were fun, but the weather's kind of bad and it's not a time that's been drawing a lot of other boats into the area. And then a lot of the crowd in South Carolina, I mean, deer season starting and oh, college yeah. football starting. <laughs> and so, you know, your, your boss man's getting other things on his mind since he's been fishing all summer. So the tournaments didn't take off, but I'd love to see him again because it was some good fishing. Um, yeah. You know, in a two day tournament in the fall, it would, it would take 10, 10 fish or something to win it. Um, yeah. I mean, I know at least six, but I would think you'd take double digits. Putting South Carolina behind, where was kind of the first area you kind of started doing a lot of bill I fishing? Mexico. Mexico. Um, yeah, we did. We started in Mexico and then kind of did all down into like the Turks and Caicos and stuff like that when it was still some decent fishing then that my first year of traveling and then after that i kind of figured out you, you needed to be you need to be in mexico every year you know so, somewhere like at best somewhere east of, somewhere like that and you needed to do those the, the south florida sailfish tournaments not south florida but like stewart you know you need to be in stewart and fort pierce in the winters for those tournaments i started doing that and then from there it just kind of we kept traveling more and more yeah, yeah. but the boat 
the boat I was on for a few years there in the beginning called the Daymaker. We did Dominican Republic one year, but for the most part, we did Isla in the winters and, you know, right after all those, like the Pelican would end. Maybe there was one right after the Pelican, but by mid-January, we were in Isla, if yeah. not before that, and um, and would stay there, then do the Bahamas, and then, then come back home. Um, and I liked it, but I, I'd freelance. I got to go couple of cool places you know, I got to go to Venezuela a couple of times before it was closed down or whatever it is now that was real good that that learned a lot lucky enough to fish with some good people there to kind of op- open my eyes to a lot of it too and um I didn't get to go really start fishing in Costa Rica until probably like 2014 or 15 something like that so I'd, I'd been traveling for a while before I got to that west coast and that was you know, obviously a whole different level. Yeah. yeah. What I've been well, used so, to. Let's, let's, I mean, that's you said a lot of good areas. I mean, let's, I got a couple of questions about some of them, but talk a little bit about Venezuela. I mean, I know a lot of the, the younger generation guys like myself, you know, we pray one day we'll be able to get to go there. I mean, so I, you know, I, I love hearing stories about guys like you and tell us how it was. Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't in the groups that got to go. I, I went, get, went down for like a week and some change two two separate seasons spread out over about two or three years. I can't remember. It was awesome, man. First year we were there. We fished with, um, we, we fished with Jimmy Grant the first year and he had a Whitaker boat down there. He was obviously super dialed in yeah. and, um, he stayed at this little I think they called it mangoes or something. The mansions, what they called it. They cooked your, I mean, it was perfect. You had an escort to go everywhere. When you walked into a restaurant, the owner of the restaurant came out and showed you the biggest, best cuts of meat. Um, it, it just, the, the, the place, the staff took care of you so well. You had your breakfast cooked in the morning before you left to go fishing. It was about eight boats, maybe tied up there. All good people. Everybody stayed right there in, in the house. And um, they cooked your lunches and the fishing was just insane. I mean, it was the, I love mixed bag fishing. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love blue marlin fishing, but I really just enjoy mixed bag fishing. And it was that, I mean, it was, you'll have a 300 pounder and you'll let it go. And your next circle might be two whites in a sail or something random like that. I mean, it's just, and you have this big tunas kind of cruising around always. We never hooked into one, but every time I was there, every day I fished, somebody was fighting one for a, a long period of time. Um, but it was crazy. I mean, that was, we were catching big numbers in Mexico, but this was just different, you know, with the whites and the sails mixed in and the blues and everything. You, you catch 30 there, <laughs> you feel a little bit better than catching 50 something in Isla. And I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's cool. I liked it a lot. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah were you there when se- Bubba Carter was there a lot too? So the second time I went, we, we fished with Bubba Ca- Carter on that tailor made boat in one of those tournaments. Um, like of course Ronnie and Big O won it, but I think we we did something. We got some money out of the deal. Second and and maybe second. I'm not sure. Second in the category, maybe. But uh yeah, so we fished with Bubba for a few days and it was awesome. I mean, it's huge learning experience. Super lucky for some little redneck from South Carolina to get to go fish with another redneck from South Carolina in <laughs> Venezuela. But the second year we were there was a little different. It was seemed like the place had kind of been taken over by the Chavistas, like the guys that sort of backed Chavez. And at that point, you didn't have an armed guard escorting you. You didn't get the red carpet rolled out at restaurants. I mean, they didn't care where we went. They'd be like, yeah, you want to walk to the other marina? Walk down the road. No problem. But it wasn't safe. I mean, that was when we kind of realized it was kind of starting to turn a little bit. And um, that we we went on that trip with Bubba for my boss at the time to to really figure out on on, uh, taking his boat down there. And he just said, man, absolutely no way. I'm going to let my jet fly into there or my boat be there. And, and you know maybe it get taken or something like that so un- unfortunately that was the last we got the last I got to see of it and that was that was quite a long time ago now that yeah. might be 15 years ago now maybe yeah um yeah that's awesome one day hopefully um also you said Turks and I I always find Turks I pass through there a lot always have haven't really fished there all that much uh, I was hoping we were going to get the fish there this year and passing but we ended up just, you know, getting straight to DR, but, uh, yeah. I mean, they've got to be there. Right. I mean, I would assume there's gotta be some decent fishing somewhere. Yeah. I mean, there was, I've seen a couple of like, by my standards, pretty, pretty big fish there. We, um, we were on kind of like a, uh, it's sort of like a family boat then. 
and uh, it's great people retired recently retired tired couple and they hired me into mate we had a pretty big planned trip that went from isla to like um grand caymans for a week or two and then jamaica for a week or two and then dominican we kind of passed right through dominican we we didn't we didn't really we stopped in punicana cop kind of wasn't finished yet big surge kind of a little bit touristy for the people. We cut it short. So we had a little bit longer trip in Turks and Caicos and it was good. We, we never had any like great days. That was kind of right when it was starting to sort of tail off, but we'd run like 50, 60 miles out to, I think it was like Mayaguez or one of, one of the banks and yeah. you'd have great fishing. I mean, you know, yellow fins, uh, dolphin, wahoo, stuff like that. We'd get some blues mixed in. I don't really ever remember catching anything besides a blue marlin here or there. And I don't ever remember catching more than a couple there. But I, I do remember on a, a, a different trip in Turks and Caicos seeing a, seeing a real big fish. We didn't we didn't catch it, but seeing it, watching it, one of them for the first time, you know, roll over on its side with its pet fin up out of the water just to try to look at the boat, the bait better. And I'd never seen anything. I didn't know that the piglins did that song. So Turks, <laughs> Turks was cool for a while. It, it was. It was good. And so I know uh, before this boat you're on, you ran a boat, uh, was it Chase and Tail? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was on the Chase and Tail for a few years. That was a lot, a lot of fun. Real competitive owner. Um, and you were in Costa Rica for a while? We were Costa Rica. We were everywhere from Ocean City, did some of the South Florida tournaments. Um, then we put a boat on a ship, went to the canal, did Costa Rica for like three seasons, two seasons on that boat. And then we had um, kind of like leased, leased the boat, the old bone shaker when Hans was running it, kind of like leased that um for the for the seasons the season prior to that did the tournaments and we went up and did like mag bay before oh, nice. it kind of got too crowded which i'm not knocking it it's not too crowded now um it's still awesome now um but that was cool but that was just like me, was me out you there. Did it? what's that how was how was mag bay when you did that i mean i loved it don't it was just the coolest you know it was awesome I, we had little spurts of good fishing to where we saw how good it could be but we were literally the only boat fishing um i was on the sap phone every night with chip schaefer him kind of trying to talk me through what i should be looking for because it was the first year my last couple years of, of going there just to fish with people you're in board shorts and a t-shirt but all the years like prior to us going chip said for that good fishing you know you needed like sweatshirt and blue jeans kind of weather on you're looking for real cold water and all of that and so we were just running all over creation looking for cold water and that's just not how it was you know it's just wasn't how it was then and that it really it now it's been i guess since then um and we i don't know I, I feel like looking back on it now after after going there a couple of other times a few other times with some people that uh i ran past I ran hundreds of miles past tons and tons of fish, yeah. but I, I just didn't know exactly what to look for. But to be honest yeah. with you, you know, when you see it, it's whales and birds and everything. We didn't see anything like that. Um, but it, I mean, the whole experience was cool. The fishing right there around Cabo was, was pretty good. Yeah. Um, and so, I, I mean, I loved it. We took the boat on its own bottom up, up the coast, um, you know, 1,600 miles, 1,650 miles from, from Los Sueños, And that was awesome. And then we ended up taking the boat back down the coast and then through the canal and up, up to Fort Pierce. So that whole, you know, the, the fishing aspect of it, we'd sort of missed it a little bit. But the whole experience, you know, for, for me and the two mates, I, I think we'd all tell you it was, it was amazing. It was really worth it. We'd get yeah. to see part of the world you don't generally get to see yeah that's, that's awesome hope one day i be able to do that uh, it's yeah it's fun i mean you will it seems like more and more boats are starting to do it if that's what your goals set at i'm sure you can make it happen um yeah. seems like most people are shipping the boats now so i guess somewhere along the lines the uh they've figured out that the money works better for the shipping the ship that year the way i remember it pretty much all of us went on our there and back on our own bottoms i, I guess timing it didn't work out I, I don't really remember um i don't think we really tried for a ship we, we knew we wanted to do it on the bottom and it yeah, was yeah. that boat it was a uh, like a 68 bayless and like 2300 gallons of fuel so they, the guys who had built it originally had built it for 
spend the time between Panama and Venezuela and uh, go a long period of time in Panama with not having the fuel, you know, yeah. so they'd run back to the to, to Panama City to fuel. And so we were doing 600 mile leg and, you know, you can you can really knock out a lot of time when you could do it like that. What, uh, how was going through the canal experience? Oh, awesome. I got lucky enough to get invited to go through it on an 80 merit when I was pretty young, just as a, I mean, a bit boat washer more so than a mate. And that, that was really cool. That was a nighttime crossing. And then we got lucky enough this past time coming back east or, or south, whichever, whichever way it is, I guess, not, not east. But uh, we did it during the day. And we had like a super aggressive pilot. And it's pretty much if the, the locks are sort of a set size and if you fit, you know, the pilot was talking to his buddies and he found like another group way in front of us. I mean, we passed all kinds of people and they said, if you can catch us, you can fit in with this tugboat or something like that. So we basically just um, just rolled through the the locks as you know as quick as you can you can't go and then once we hit the lake and the canals and all he just said man you give me as much speed as you're willing to give me right now and we won't we might not have to wait but the kicker was if we had to wait we couldn't fit in with any of those other groups so we were going to end up anchoring in the lake for quite a few hours if not a day and i'll be honest with you i, I wasn't i didn't mind that like i was yeah. almost looking forward to that happening but that was the only time I've ever gotten to see it all during the day. And I, I, it's just amazing. Um, it really is. I loved it. Uh, I loved everything about it. But we kind of, the daytime crossing sort of popped us out at a little bit of a weird time uh, of as far as getting somewhere we needed to get to after that to get fuel. So we ended up having to stop in San Andreas, it's like that little Colombian island um, off of Honduras maybe or something. But uh, so that was cool. So we got a Colombian passport or a stamp on our passport, uh, yeah. but so we stopped and killed some time there and then left out of there, I guess, like right before dark to, to go up to towards Isla to get fuel. But yeah, it was awesome. That was a cool, cool yeah, experience. That's yeah. an awesome experience for sure. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people are missing out nowadays. I, I don't understand why a lot of the owners don't want to go through, you know, on, on their boats when their boats are going yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. Um, cause it doesn't seem to me to be like too much of a pain in the butt or anything like that. Um, you know, you're not like sitting around waiting a lot or I don't know. I liked it. I thought it yeah, was really cool. That's sick. Yeah, that was good. And so how was, how, how much time did, were you guys in Los Sueños or Capos when you were in Costa Rica? Mm -hmm. We were in Los Sueños. We were there for like full time straight through for like two years. And, um, then, like I said, we had done the season prior to that sort of rented out another boat. And uh, so we got to do this, the fad fishing there in, in the off season, well, in July and then just in the off season, you know, and it was amazing. Some of my favorite trips ever. We got, um, we never got in on any of the off season, like rainy season, 10 miles out at a marina, really, really good blue marlin fishing or anything like that. But, you know, some guys around us did. We were pretty much, if we were, you know, given the green light to fish during that time, we we tried to do the fad trips or, you know, some combination of a sailfish and fad trip. Um, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And it wasn't, I don't know, I, I wasn't at the leading edge of that. So it would probably be considered crowded by a lot of people's standards, even by the time I got there. But I didn't think it was crowded. And after that third Los Sueños tournament, I mean, the marina cleared out, basically. Everybody was leaving, you know, to get on that first ship. So you had it yourself. I mean, the the main thing I could remember being at the fads would be just like just us and Bubba Carter and maybe one other boat or something like that. It was never, I never remember a crowd or, or anything. Yeah. Um, I liked it. We, we got some really good fishing during the regular seasons. Um, just really good fishing. A lot of people own it. So you learn a lot about fishing with the crowd, you learned a lot about those fish there seemed to me to be kind of mo moving as you were catching them and you kind of try to pick which way you feel like they're moving and stay at that leading edge because they seem to be sort of concentrated more at that leading edge and just watching people like John Bayless and Ronnie Fields those those couple of years just it's like they just knew you know they'd catch a quad and they'd already have their dredges in the boat they just pick up and run like a half a mile 
and plop back out. And it, it took me a little while to start trying to figure out, you know, what they were doing, but they, they had it figured out. They did a, um, it's interesting. It's a lot of good stuff to learn over there, but anywhere where you're getting, you know, 60, 80 bite day, you're going to learn a lot. Yeah. Well, I know. I mean, so tell me, or what, what would be one of the reasons why to catch a quad? And I mean, we do that sometimes here in South Florida with sail fishing, but you know, what, what would be a, a good, I guess, scenario that that would happen there? I mean, if, if you really feel like you have it pinpointed to, to which way to fish or push it, and you feel like maybe you got held up on that quad a little too long, and, and you might be trying to chase up into the tail of the fish, and it's um, Bubba Carter put it best, and I can't quote it exactly like him, but he basically was telling me to come to him, and I was catching, you know, I was catching a bunch, but I was catching singles and doubles. He was like, Jay, you're catching doubles. I'm catching quads. Move. So, I mean, I think it's just if you've got a pretty good idea of where they're moving to, you don't want to be chasing them and kind of get mired in the pack. So, you might would just pick and try to get on the other side of the pack. And, you know, if you're you're trying to catch that many fish and, and one one fish will matter, you know, one fish, you know, might be decide between if you win or not then you can't take the risk of hanging back with everybody else you know yeah. if you feel like you know where they're going you you pick up and get get in front of them some of those guys really had it dialed in down there for that and I've, I've tried to try to kind of have that in in the east coast and I, I haven't been able to dial it in in the east coast i don't know if they just don't move the same or i just can't figure it out but i hadn't experienced that yet over here yeah well, <laughs> i mean it, you know, I, that definitely happens a lot with us in South Florida with the sailfish. I mean, I mean, it might be a little easier, you know, they're kind of typically swimming north to south. So we kind of mm -hmm. have, but yeah, just trying to get in front of them. And like you said, catching a, a quad and then, you know, if running south of them and trying to get in front of them again or sitting tight thinking, you know, there's more coming, you know, it's always a toss up. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a toss up. That was, it was cool when when we were there, there were some really big bodies of fish. The last tournament day I fished there, I think Legrone won it. And I, I, I might be wrong on the numbers, but I really think he caught like 40 fish in the last two hours. And, and it was just a body of fish that was not a particularly big body of fish, but it supported 50, 40 boats on top of it for the last like two and a half hours of fishing and just huge numbers. I mean... So, I, and I don't know, I thought all that was really good over there. And th those fish, when they were moving, you kind of wanted to stay right in front of them. And uh, I don't know, all of that was really good to experience, I felt like. How do you, uh, I mean, I know when we, we, we talk, we have guys that fish a lot over there in Costa Rica and stuff. Uh, you know, there are a lot of them are spoiled, you know, when they come back here and fish on the East Coast or DR or wherever, you know, at, you know a lot rougher. You know, how do you? How do you look at fishing the two different areas? I mean, are you spoiled? Is it, do you miss fishing over there? Yeah, I mean, I do. I, I very much miss fishing over there, but I mean, you know, I'm at a different time in my life right now. You know, I've got a, a almost two year old son and a wife and a you know another son on the way nice. this winter, and you know, it's just just it's just a different time of my life right now but yeah, yeah i miss it you you definitely get spoiled we laughed about that a lot in dominican republic this winter because it was just kind of stupid rough a, a lot of the days and it was kind of considered a calm winter for for them and the grass was just so damn bad and uh uh, you know, and then same thing with just uh, Big Rock. We we wow. just, we had a decent tournament season, but we didn't have a bite during Big Rock. And that's that's long days and it's, you know, four out of six and then, you know, pre-fish day or two. And it's just no bites in any of them. And yeah, I mean, your mind's definitely like, you know, I wonder what they're doing in Costa Rica right now. Yeah, yeah. You, you do get spoiled. Yeah, it happens, man. Yeah, especially DR, man. DR will, it can wear you out. Few yeah days. yeah especially yeah, that first eight miles man that's not it's relentless <laughs> yeah that's right we were having to run to um at the end we like the february moon and then in march we were having to run around from cop con to costa de campo and sometimes that last 20 miles of that ride back was really just kind of making you miss that slick calm costa rica but i mean costa rica has its challenges coast like los sueños 
the Lithuania's tournament, they like the first time I ever completely lost a fleet. Like, I, I don't feel like, even with listening to my radio and the channels I was on, I didn't feel like I had any idea where the fleet that was catching the fish were, because it just seems like there's so many different, you know, it's like almost every point on the compass you could run to for fish, um, you know, whereas at least the East Coast, for us in South Carolina, you've got that Gulf Stream and then you've got the ledge that, that really kind of dictate, they're going to be somewhere between the two of those. And that, that kind of helps. It sort of takes like one axis out of the whole decision-making process. And so, I mean, Costa Rica has its challenges, yeah. but roughness isn't, isn't usually one of them. <laughs> and bad fishing isn't usually one of them either, unless, you know, unless you're in the wrong spot, but <laughs> it was good. Well, let's talk, uh, I know we touched on it uh, a little bit before, but let's talk a little bit about DR. I know you were just there. You know, my boat's there right now and you guys just put got the sonar in. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that transition and how you're liking it. Yeah, I mean, I'm loving it. And I think that uh, we got, so we got it put in in January and left basically the next day and went straight to straight to DR, caught Connor and started fishing. And, you know, like I told you before, I thought it was a great place to learn on it because you could, you know, see the marks on your sonar and then you could look over and see the fab with your eyes. So you kind of got an idea of, how it all sort of worked out where it was and all that. And, you, you know, they're not like we talked about, they are plenty of them off of the fads that you find more now with the sonar, but it, they're kind of still congregated somewhat around the fads. So you're not just like riding around in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you, it's a very target rich environment. And uh, everybody there was super nice at helping me get kind of dialed in as, as best as possible with the settings and everything like that. I, th I thought it was a great place to learn. We went straight from there to the Bahamas. Our trip got sh cut short there, but I love fishing there at the Abacos. But that, that was just my first indication that the rest of the East Coast was not going to be quite as easy for the sonar as, as the Dominican Republic was. But I mean, it completely changed Dominican Republic fishing for me. It used to be if, uh, you know, if you knew it was going to be a crowd, you left crack of dawn and you got on your fad and you just circled it tight. You try to protect it and keep everybody out of your circles. And, and yeah. now, I mean, if somebody comes on the fad I'm on, I'll just wander off of it a half yeah. mile and kind of look for something else. Cause that sonar kind of lets you know, you can find them. Yeah. So it sort of changed, changed the way I felt, thought about fishing there in Dominican, but we liked it. It was a good, I think it was a pretty good season. We had, we didn't have any like game busters day. Maybe we caught 10 out of 15 or something one day. Most of that was like, I don't think we had a fish at noon that day. So it felt like a really good day. But for the most part, we just watched the Salty Fair catch fish and tried to do as close as we can to them. That's pretty much it. Yeah, I think that's most of us kind of watch that show a lot. Yeah. Those guys yeah. are, those boys are dialed in. That's for sure. Yeah, they are. They always have. When they had the Caroline, they would come through here. We'd fish with them in Oregon Inlet, and they'd come to some of the Charleston tournaments, and they were they were super hard to beat then. So they got I think Watson and James do a good job, that's for sure. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. They fish hard, though, man. They lead first one to leave, last one back. So you got to mm -hmm. give them Yeah, boys. yeah, they, they fish do. hard. And it, yeah, they do, and it makes a difference. I mean, you know, first first pass on that fad usually seems to be the most productive and you know the earlier you leave you kind of working out the chain ahead of everybody else and that helps and yeah. staying you're out fishing, later yeah you're fishing you've already fished 10 fads before the second boat gets out there yeah yeah i mean yeah yeah there was plenty of days when we were leaving out after they had already had a couple two or three at least but you know it is what it is different yeah. operation and we were we were having fun with what what we were catching and uh it was uh i don't think we did any dawn to dark days but it does make a huge difference when you do those that's for sure and th those guys work hard at it and fish hard fish long so how was uh you, you you went around to casa de campo too well we just were running back and forth um because my boss had a, a house he liked a lot rented and um there's groups that came in liked it and just you know in the grand scheme of things it's not that far we're kind of used to running 50 miles anyway and um fuel wasn't particularly expensive down there this year compared to, to a home i mean it was a couple of dollars cheaper than it was at home um in florida in particular so uh yeah we would just run run around 
And there was a couple of days that we couldn't get to where the fishing was. It was, it would have been like 65, 70 miles. You know, they were on those fads more to the West or yeah, I think West, whatever that you would, would be. Leave, of, you would leave from Casa de Campo and then go fish the fads off there and then run all the way back. We'd leave from Cop Cana and go fish Casa de Campo fads and then come back. Yeah. Oh. We'd fish like I've always, any season I've been at Casa de Campo, I kind of fish off for that island, which is way to the east anyway. And so they're the closest ones to Cop Cana. And I was lucky enough this year that they were holding, you know, those were the ones holding fish. So, I mean, one of the days, I think it was maybe only like 30 and some change from where we had had our good day. To, to running back to Cop Connor. So it wasn't that bad. But like I said, eventually the fishing moved further to the west and, and we couldn't. We were kind of out to lunch then. We were sort of just dealing with scraps and then having to get back at the end of the day and listening to, you know, them catching 15 and 16 and all that. So it, I, I wouldn't recommend doing what we did. I, I would recommend if you if you want to move over there, move over there. So what was, that was off of what? Was it Saona, is it, or something? Yeah, Isla de Saona. Yeah. yeah. And it was... I mean, it was fun. It's good fishing. There's, the fish act different to me there. They tease a lot better in, in Casa de Campo, a um, little bit bigger fish. When we first got, I think, the January moon in Cop Cana, I mean, some of our blue marlin that we call, I, I'm really not kidding when I say they were less than 30 pounds. There, there was a couple that we caught that we didn't do it, but you could have hold both of them, you know, one in one hand by yeah, the like, bill and the other yeah. one. In the, yeah, exactly. Easily. I mean, it was, they'd come in you just see this little wispiness behind the bait and be like, man, I I think it's a blue marlin, but I don't know. We're going to have to reel it up and look at it. You know, it it could be a wahoo. I'm not sure it's so small, but then, then you get over to, you get over to Casa de Campo and you, you know, you see a 150 pounder again. You're just like, Oh man, he's a big one. And he he gets up and you see what it is. But, um, but it, it was, I mean, it was worth the run for us because uh, starting in the February moon moon this past year, I mean, it just it shut right down at, at Cop Cana. I mean, it's just like somebody turned the light switch off. We ran out there and the water was dirty and there was no bait and no bite. And we did that for like two or three days. And most of our groups that were coming in that my boss had coming in were only in for like three or four days. So you don't really want to give them too many bad days. And yeah. so we talked about all the different things, you know, if we wanted to have the drive driver you know just us take the boat and we'll stay on the boat there and have the driver drive them around we, we kind of ran through all the scenarios and just came up with the running around back and forth it wasn't bad wow that was yeah not too long ago yeah and then you went around we, what time when did you leave dr we left there in like march i don't remember the exact dates i think it was after the march moon maybe third week in march something like that it might have been a touch later than that and then went back to florida Stayed at Sailfish for like a couple of weeks, just kind of reprovisioning a little bit of stuff. And then we went over to the Abacos. We usually do some of those skip tournaments and stay over there in the Abacos and enjoy it a lot. And um, like the day before, um, my boss and his uh, people were flying in for the custom shootout. He tested positive for COVID, so he couldn't get his travel visa. And um, and so we we basically just my my wife and I and one of the mates were over there fishing just pre fishing, and we basically just got you know just pretty much mid midday just like all right well we're gonna go back and pack things up and leave and my wife and I brought the boat back and the mate got to stay and fish on the seven with Jimmy and they won they did they did well I think it was good fishing for some people during that tournament so yeah. he had a good he had a good time there but we uh we had to come on home yeah few of those stories this year (laughs) yeah yeah it's been a crazy that's cool your wife got to go how's she how's she like fishing she likes it she's getting good she's uh you know she'll sit there and hold a flat line all day or hold a long rigger and she'll hook them you know if they come to her and yeah i mean she's done mexico dr that's awesome um you know, Ab- we spent a lot of time in the Abacos together and uh, lucky enough that my boss and his wife let her fish with us a fair amount. So, I mean, but yeah, she'll, she'll feed them right off the teaser and <laughs> she's getting good at it. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. It's cool yeah, to be able to, good. you know, get the, get the wives mixed in when, you know, obviously it always depends on the operation, but it's yeah. nice when uh, you get an operation that, you know, you're allowed to have that situation, you know? Yeah, man, it, it, it helps a ton. Yeah, I mean, there was, yeah, it's just kind of the point of my life and that I am, I'm in right now. I'm 46 and, 
very, very much settled down. So the more she gets to come, the you know, the happier I am for traveling for sure. Happy wife. But she, I mean, she helps out a lot on the boat too. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I mean, yeah. She she does. She does. She uh, she works hard on the boat when when she's around. Yeah. So what uh, you think you guys will go back to DR in the future? I would think so. Yeah, I, I think my boss and his wife liked it a lot. Um, I, I know we're not going this season. Um, we're not, we're kind of in the middle of getting a bunch of stuff done to the boat. And then we've got a baby just due in February and they were cool enough to say, you know what, let's just not travel the boat too much. We might come down like South Florida or something like that. And that's, that'll be about it until the spring. Nice. But yeah, I think he, I think he'll definitely go back. I, I would think he'd go back to DR. It was, it was good fishing. All the people liked it. All the, yeah, everything about it. I feel like they like. Yeah, man, DR is a, it's a good place. I mean, it's, you know, you got good restaurants, you could have nice accommodations, almost a lot of things you need. I mean, people are nice. It's a good place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's safe, you know, especially in there behind the gates and everything and, uh, and good, you know, and good fishing. <laughs> that, that helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Hoping now we're starting to get really good. I know a couple of years ago, you know, when I was there, November was October, November were like the two best months. So hoping uh, happens again now for us. Yeah, yeah, I hope it does too. How long are you guys gonna stay there? Uh, we're gonna fish that little tournament there on Cap Cana in like middle October and see how fishing is. Uh, you know, definitely stay through the end of October and then we'll see. May bring the boat home after that or uh, stay a little bit longer in November. But then definitely November because I gotta I kind of start fishing all the sailfish stuff. So gotta yeah. start getting ready for all that. And that's the live bait and stuff. Yeah. That's cool. Those tournaments have gotten super competitive. Yeah, I really have a lot of a lot of people doing them. That's for sure. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's a good thing for the purse. Yeah. I think that's how I look at it, at least. Yeah, no, that's great. A lot of a lot of good teams now. A lot of people are yeah, like you said, fishing's just becoming more popular, man. So mm -hmm. it's good. Yeah, I guess Michael building, Jordan's building. probably doing a lot for it too. <laughs> yeah i'm sure he is man they're they're doing that he and stetson they had a good mid-atlantic i guess it was yeah man, man. atlantic tournament yeah. they just been he, i mean honestly stetson's kind of just been on a roll now for a little bit i mean does mm -hmm. well down in south florida and obviously does really well up there so good yeah on. yeah yeah well he's always been real good he deserves it yeah. hard worker and a good fisherman yeah he is good dude they definitely got a motivated boss <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> Yeah. a competitive boss that's for sure a competitive boss somebody who's, yeah he's a competitor that, that helps a ton that yeah helps a ton. absolutely yeah. cool man i appreciate uh definitely appreciate your time and your stories and uh looking forward to hopefully uh maybe crossing paths one day yeah man nice talking to you too nick and um yeah enjoyed it yeah best of luck with uh, the little one on the way that's got to be exciting so congratulations with that yeah man we're excited about it we are so it's going to appreciate it, man. And good luck uh, the rest of your time in Dominican Republic. All right, Cap. Appreciate it, man.